first we're going to start off with a live action demonstration of balance. Or imbalance. We'll see how it goes, all right? I keep going until you clap harder. There you go. <laughs> Growing up a rope spinner, I learned a thing or two about balance. Spin that rope too fast or too slow, and you either can't get through the loop or you have no loop to get through. Growing up a rancher, I learned a lot about balance. Growing up on a ranch, I learned that you had to balance the needs and the appetite of the cows with the nutrition and the growth of the grass, the depth of your hay pile before winter set in. Also, I learned about cowboy logic. I got to live, learn, and write about cowboy logic. The 21 years I spent uh, writing a column and the three books I published all had the words cowboy logic in their title. But what really is this cowboy logic stuff? It's probably easiest to explain in a story or two. Cowboy logic is an intuition, it's a, it's a way of thinking that was modeled to me by my father and a lot of other just real, matter of fact kind of cowboys. And maybe one story would help illustrate. Dad had returned from World War II, had a horse that needed breaking, he'd been gone for over three years, and he got this horse broke and a friend of his named Morris came over to the ranch. He saw that horse and he fell in love with it. And my dad's name was Bud, and Morris said, Buddy, he said, what do you got to have for me to buy that horse? Dad looked at Morris and said, Morris, I'd need to have about $75 for that horse, which was a pretty good sum of money in 1947. Morris had done pretty well for himself, and he dug into his front pocket and he pulled out a check that was made out to him. And it was made out to him for $1,200. And he handed it to Dad to consummate the sale. And he said, Buddy, can you cash this? Dad looked at him and said, Morris, he said, if I could cash that check, I wouldn't be selling this horse. <laughs> so all Morris left with that day was a little bit of cowboy logic until he could come back a few days later with a 50, a 20, and a 5 and buy that horse. A good friend of our family recorded another piece of cowboy logic from my dad and my mom, Liz Taylor. You might have heard of her. In a late-night conversation they had, back in an age when phones were attached to walls. It was called a 2 a.m. call, and the poet's name is Rodney Nelson from Elmont, North Dakota. A 2 a.m. call is no fun at all for a rancher who needs his rest. To heck with the thing, just let it ring. Bud would not leave his warm nest. But Bud, Liz cried, what if someone has died? Her voice, though uncertain, was warning. Well, hell, Bud said, if someone is dead, he'll still be dead in the morning. <laughs> so that's the cowboy logic that I grew up with. It's the cowboy logic, it's the way of thinking that allows me to maybe get to a simple nub of truth every once in a while. Simple truths that I use to connect things that some might consider disparate, like conservation and agriculture. Preserving the resource and using the resource, cowboy logically, it can be done. I have an admission to make. I love grass. I love grass, my cows love grass, wildlife loves grass, the birds love to nest in that grass, that guy I knew in college loved to smoke grass, <laughs> but the grass I loved was different. It was native prairie, native prairie that uh, is intact on our place and we get the honor and the responsibility to steward a couple thousand acres of it. Now not only do we love grass, but the grass loves us back, which you may not know. The grass loves us back by helping us with our problems. In our world, we have a carbon problem. We have too much carbon in the air and not enough carbon in the soil. And we can look to grass for some help with that. Grass stores carbon because it's never been disturbed in this state. And we ought not disturb it and leave that carbon where it's at. But what's more so, it can also sequester carbon. Take it out of the atmosphere through photosynthesis down into the plant itself and into the roots. And when it's into the roots, it can attach some of that carbon to the soil, keep it there out of harm's way. Carbon loves us back, or grasslands love us back and helps us with our carbon. So much like functioning forests and healthy oceans, we need to revere and cherish vibrant 
and dynamic grasslands. It makes cowboy logic sense. But how do we keep our grasslands vibrant and dynamic? Well, we bring in the cows. Grasslands evolved under herds of large, sharp-hooved ruminants called bison. Bison would come onto a piece of grass, and they would eat, and they'd graze, and then they would till it up with their hooves, and, and they'd defecate, and they'd urinate, and then they'd move on for a good long time, and they wouldn't come back to that spot for a while. Cows can do the same thing if we manage them with managed rotational grazing like we do on our ranch. The cows go onto a pasture, and they graze, and they eat, and they paw, and they till up the soil, and they defecate, and they urinate, and, and then we move them to another pasture. And we don't return to that pasture for a good long while, so it gets a rest. That is how the grass evolved, and it responds. It grows, it becomes lush, it grows, and it grows again. It actually uh, consumes carbon that way because you're stimulating that growth. You have seeds that were laying there that you didn't even know were there that now sprout up. Good seeds, good plants, and your plant community becomes more diverse, like a smorgasbord for the cows. And the cows hit that smorgasbord and they create beef, and that's a pretty good deal. So along with the cows and the grasslands and, and what we respect there, I know that we can't, we can't eat grease or grass ourselves, right? And, uh, and we can't uh, just eat beef, I suppose. <laughs> we got to have some side dishes, right? We need a lot of food growing in this world. And when we're growing food, I would say, just like we need grasslands, we need diversity when we're growing our food. The principles of soil health would say you need diversity, you need plant cover. Principles of soil health on our croplands in North Dakota would say that you need to minimally disturb the soil, right? So if you were never exposed to a plow in your life, and you came across the first plow furrow in the ground, and the story says that a Native American man once did, he saw that scar in the earth, that plow fur, and he just looked down and said, wrong side up, which would be a little bit of cowboy logic in a way. Soil health says leave the right side up, and we do that now with no-till and minimum tillage as much as we can. We also need to rotate our crops. So just like the grass, they need diversity. We can't grow the same thing every year. We need to methodically and systematically rotate our crops. And becoming more and more popular as we learn more and more, we need cover crops. Cover crops are those seeds, uh, three or four or 15 different varieties that are interseeded with and among or sometimes after the food crops that we grow. Things like rye and triticale and hairy vetch and clover and, and uh, radishes and turnips. They add nutrients to the soil. Their sole purpose is there to feed the soil. They drive roots into the ground that lets you incorporate the rainwater in a much more efficient way. They are the crops that, once you take the food crop off, it actually leaves something for cattle. And we believe in integrating cattle even onto these crop lands so that they can do what? Graze, paw, defecate, urinate, everybody all together. <laughs> and when I say defecate and urinate, don't jump back. These are terms of endearment in the world of soil health, okay? So we need our grasslands. We need diversity in our, our crop lands. And we also need water. We need water to drink. We need rainwater to feed our plants. We need water that stays where it's put and doesn't just rush down gullies into rivers and, and overflow their banks, flood our cities. And if it rushes all the way down to the mouth of the Mississippi, we don't want it carrying our topsoil and we don't want it carrying the nutrients that we want to feed the plants on the lands that we had the nutrients on. Because when that, those nutrients get to the mouth of the Mississippi, they've created what's called a dead zone. And those nutrients that were precious to us on the land are now toxic and tragic to the sea life that can no longer grow there at the mouth of the Mississippi. So when we need water, what we need is wetlands. We need the wetlands that actually clean and filter the water just the way they were intended to when they were put there, right? We need wetlands to retain water to help recharge our aquifers and refill our groundwater stores. We need the wetlands to just do what they were meant to do in a cowboy logical kind of way. These things I just mentioned, grazing like the buffalo, making our croplands as diverse as our grasslands, letting our wetlands just do what they're supposed to do. These are what my science colleagues at Ducks Unlimited would call ecosystem services. Ecosystem services are those things that are done every day on, on farms and ranches. They make agronomic and economic sense. They're done by farmers and ranchers on private lands, but they are cheered and supported by conservationists. They are increasingly incentivized and even rewarded by the public 
because we've learned to assign a value to these things that help us with carbon, that help us with our food and build our soil for the future, that help us make our water clean again and help us not flood. Ecosystem services make cowboy logical sense. So you might know cowboy logic and you might understand it and you find a few nubs of truth, but it doesn't always get put into practice. And when I think about how you take a simple truth and put it into practice, I was most reminded of that when I was a bush fellow and I was actually in Norway studying how they harvest their oil and gas. I went to visit my old relatives in Norway to see how they did this because I knew that as they discovered oil in the North Sea and the waters around Norway, they had to go and get oil out from underneath a fishery that had fed their people for generations. And they wanted to make sure that they harvested that oil in such a way that their fisheries still had the integrity and the purity they needed to eat out of those waters. And in North Dakota, I believe there was lessons to be learned because we were going to harvest oil and gas out from underneath the ground that we feed on, right? Through our croplands and our livestock that graze above them. So I had a chance to go out into the North Sea in a crew helicopter, spend the whole day on one of the platforms that had been producing oil since 1971, see how carefully they do it under a system that asked them to be careful. I went back on shore and I got to visit with the oil driller of another company operating not only off the shore in Norway but around the world. And as we were visiting, we got on the topic of an incident that most people are familiar with called the Deepwater Horizon. The Deepwater Horizon was in the Gulf of Mexico, as you remember, in 2010. It was the platform and the drilling site that had a blowout, that uh, had an explosion, that actually ended up releasing 4.9 million barrels of oil into the Gulf of Mexico and tragically resulted in the death of 11 workers on that platform. So I asked my friend who knew oil drilling in oceans. I said, could something have been done to prevent that? Was there some piece of technology that was missing? We always look for a technical fix, right? Was there something that the government should have required that was not? And what he told me, I'll always remember. He said, my company that I work for had a platform in the very same area of the Gulf of Mexico. And he said, we were in that same deep water and we had the same kind of troubles. He said, there was pressures and there was disruptions. It was a hard go. And then he paused and he said, but we are Norwegians and sometimes we just back off and we take it easy. And those words stuck with me. I had learned a little piece of cowboy logic from a guy who wasn't even a cowboy. <laughs> I learned a piece of cowboy logic that has a benefit to ecology, that helps balance what we use and what we're preserving, right, in our world. And I believe that each and every one of us can do the same thing. Find these little nubs of cowboy logic that not only help us eat and have clean water, but help us have a livable planet, right? That's free from harm, that gives us security, that gives us a connection to nature that restores our soul. I believe we can do this just like my son and I here in this picture by working together. I believe we can do it with farmers and ranchers, with grazing like the buffalo, with having our croplands as diverse as our grasslands, with letting our wetlands do what they were meant to do. But most importantly, not only can we do it with farmers and ranchers, we can do it with people in cities and suburbs. We can do it with folks who are part of agriculture and people who are part of the conservation culture. We can do this together. We can make life better. And we can do it in harmony, in community, and in cowboy logical balance. Thank you. Thank you.